Hello, welcome to this experimental video on Final Fantasy XIV. Today I'm going to be looking at Shisui of the Violet Tides, a dungeon from Stormblood. I would like to apologize in advance to the Japanese language and everyone who speaks it for the upcoming mispronunciations and poor attempts to understand the nuance of a language I don't speak using only Google and Wikipedia. Currently, I am wearing tank gear. Yes, this is actually gear intended for a tank. You can tell how protective it's meant to be by the fact that there's padding on it. See, there's padding on the shoulders and uh, right over my groin. So, yeah, very protective. To be fair, all the gear from the dungeon looks like this, only with minor variations. And it's no less skimpy on men, though perhaps a little more functional, as it's based on real-world Mongolian wrestling attire. Interestingly, this gear was first adopted as a way to expose any women who were trying to sneak into the wrestling tournaments. This was an actual problem, because women were regularly sneaking in, winning the tournament, and shaming all their male opponents. Can't have women winning. Better to just ban them entirely. This is actual history. Anyway, moving into the actual dungeon now, Shisui is the royal palace of the Ara that rule the Ruby Sea. They are led by a princess. A witch came to the palace offering protection, but instead summoned a bunch of demons, or void scent as they're more commonly called. The princess and her royal guard have been possessed, our approach to the dungeon is through the Sokyoku fishery. As you may notice, we are not actually underwater here. We're in a bit of a dome. The fish can float because a lot of things in Final Fantasy XIV are based on elemental affinity. These fish are slightly aspected to air, meaning they can breathe air and they also can hover. The name of the fish, Hatsugyo, is a Japanese word for exile. The kanji literally meaning, please go away. The violet coral shell is a basic crab type enemy. Violet is considered a royal color in Japan, just like in the West. So that's probably why the color comes up a lot in this. You can also see the Ilysia of an anglerfish like Ogrebon. They spend most of their adult lives buried until prey comes along and then they jump out and eat it. These ones will jump out and attack you if you walk by, serving more as a trap than a monster. As for this area's name, Sokyoku is a genre of Japanese classical music. If you think of stereotypical Japanese music, you're probably thinking of Sokyoku. In the next group of enemies, we encounter a sea serpent called Hikagiri. Also, forgive my Japanese pronunciation on all of this. Hikagiri means long as days. The best explanation I have for this name is, well, sea serpent is long. Our approach is met by a locked gate, so we find another way around with these geysers. In the next group of enemies, we meet a new variant on the lurking Ogrebon, one which is actually attacking us, called an Ango. Note how its lights are red instead of blue. Perhaps it's angry at us for some reason. Hold that thought for a minute. Also, Ango might seem like just a shortening of anglerfish. However, it's also a term for a Buddhist retreat lasting about three months. It means literally dwelling in peace, which might be ironic in this case. When we've almost defeated this wave, suddenly we get attacked by a bunch of smaller anglerfish called Mutsu, which is a kind of Japanese apple. I'm not entirely sure of the relevance, but considering this is a fishery, I think it's a good guess that these are the juveniles. The ones with blue antennae hiding under the dirt are probably the adult form, while the red ones are a breeding pair. Yes, this is unusual behavior for fish, but, you know, so is flying. Now for the first boss battle at Haratsuge Gate. I don't need to look that up. It's actually a fish end game. Now to the first boss. This creature, the Amikiri, 
is based on a Japanese yokai, so it's probably a void scent. Amikiri means net cutter. They would cut both fishing and mosquito nets, thus potentially bringing starvation and disease. During the fight, it summons Kamikiri, which appear as just smaller versions of itself, but, but are actually a very different yokai, one that cuts people's hair, either while they walk by or while they sleep. These ones could sometimes be a semi-benevolent spirit, as cutting someone's hair could ruin an arranged marriage for some reason. They would do this if the spouse was another yokai in disguise. Maybe a hint here. Now an aspect of dungeon design in Final Fantasy XIV that I find interesting is, especially later in the game, the way that bosses act as a barrier between almost worlds. On one side of the boss, we were outside fighting territorial fish. And as soon as we enter, we are attacked by the possessed palace guards. In the brief, easy-to-miss word balloons, you can see them struggling with their possessing demons. If you look closely, you can see that the palace guards are all wearing shisui tops. But palace guards apparently get real pants and or skirts depending on class. Dragoons and ninja get pants. Warriors, archers, paladins, and samurai all get skirts regardless of gender. The ruby princess's attire makes her look vaguely like a koi. Now, interestingly, we later find out this is not the real ruby princess, but merely a handmaiden who served as her body double. The real ruby princess feels immense guilt about this, and there's a quest chain where you try to revive her, eventually succeeding. The two are apparently quite close. Why is the handmaiden talking about protecting the ruby sea? It's not her sea. It can't just be an act. I mean, she was possessed by a freaking demon. You think it would drop the princess act by now? No, I believe this is the final boss talking through her. Which, when we see the final boss, raises the question of who are her people? In this boss fight, there are four chests around the room. When you activate one, you turn into an old lady. This is used to protect you from the princess's seduction attack. Presumably, being an old crone just takes you right out of the mood. After beating her, we leave Kogyoku Palace, which I should note was named after the second female emperor of Japan, and we head into Shisui Temple. Now seems like a good time to point out that Shisui means still water, but it can also mean death water. Something I know if I was ever a fan of Naruto, which I wasn't. Pirates rule ninjas drool. <clears throat> anyway, I'm sorry, I could not find any translation for Unkyu. And if you know what that means, then, you know, let me know. I'm always ready to learn. It looks vaguely like a giant horseshoe crab. Kraken is a rather well-known sea monster, though this is either a juvenile or a smaller related species, as we've seen a real kraken and it's fucking enormous. Tatsunoko is simply the Japanese word for seahorse. I... I... I don't see it. I don't see a resemblance at all. Sorry. Now, the exploding pufferfish going by are called bombfish. Interestingly enough, they're not supposed to actually explode. Now, they have been known to explode when thrown on a grill because all the fat in them is basically lamp oil. So the fact that these fish just explode is probably a good sign that the animals in this area are also possessed, such as these flying sharks. Now, flying sharks are not actually unusual in the world of Final Fantasy XIV, but as we'll see with the final boss in just a minute, she's capable of summoning sharks that are explicitly labeled as kami. It's interesting to note that in this garden area, we find actual trees. Outside, in the palace grounds, we only found coral. But here, we find actual trees. Now, here at last, we are at the final boss. She looks a little bit like Ursula the Sea Witch, with that gross jaw down below. Slightly evocative of Vagina Dentata. Look it up or ask your parents. 
As for the boss's name, I have not been able to find out what Yohi means in Japanese. Anyone who actually speaks a language want to help here? The symbol on the floor here is one that shows up a lot, like in the previous two treasure chests. I have to assume it is some sort of symbol of the royal lineage. Now the sharks here, Naishi no Jo and Naishi no Kami, are actually titles from the Imperial Court of Japan. They are handmaids to the princess or empress. So putting all this together into a theory, I theorize that Shisui Yohi is actually a deposed empress. Perhaps she consorted with demons, and in turn became one. But everything about her points to her actually being a part of this power structure, albeit one that everyone would rather forget. At least, that's my current speculation. We'll see if we ever get a Shisui hard mode. And now I close in a comparison shot of the male and female armor. Granted, mine is the tank set, while his is the dragoon set, but you can see they're pretty close.